Hey, everybody out there in uh, Yamaha Guitar Land. This is uh, Eric Klein, Chief Product Design Architect here at Line 6. And this marks, this uh, past June 11th, marks the fifth uh, anniversary of the day we announced Helix. And since then, there have been a lot of changes and a lot of products and a lot of updates and a lot of new members to the community and a lot of friends and a lot of parties. And uh, we just wanted to take a look at what happened and got us to where we're at today. Um, and, and some people at the organization might not be too thrilled for showing how some sausage is made, but I don't care. It's gonna be fun and interesting. Uh, we're gonna take a look at some of the early designs of Helix and I'll, I'll warn you now, there's some bad design in it. So uh, so it's, it's a lesson on what not to do, but uh, it, it may show you sort of the process and um, and give you a little bit of insight as to how we work and and how we push forward and how we constantly are trying to, to better ourselves. Um, also, it's it's also the first open house where my dog gets to hang out. So we need to bring dogs to Nam. Nick, maybe you can work on getting that done. But um, anyway, I'm gonna show you a presentation. This is something we showed at the Nam show this past January uh, to a, a small group, well, not a small group, couple hundred people. We had a, a big party on Friday night and we showed people sort of some of the secret early Helix designs. And we said, let's show that to everybody. So for better or worse, we're going to do it. Here we go. All right, you ready? Here we go. Helix history. I promise this isn't drunk history. All right, so the history of Helix goes all the way back to October of 2008. This is actually before I started Line 6. And when uh, one of the first things I did when I joined the company is they gave me access to all of the designs that, that Line 6 has ever done. And there were dozens, hundreds of designs that never made it as products. And one of the things that kind of stuck out was this thing called Veta System. Veta System looked like an X3 except it had an extra row of switches and some scribble strips. And I mentioned, oh, is this a, a new X3 that you guys, like a bigger X3 that you guys had talked about? Because this is before Pod HD 500 came out. And I'm like, oh no, that's Veta system. This is something that we wanted to sell with a tube amp and it would come as a package. So you couldn't buy it separately. It would be the mo floor modeler with the tube amp and they would talk back and forth. And as you changed amps or as, as you changed parameters, in uh, in the floor unit, the tube amp would change its tube amp topology, its class, uh, its um, uh, all sorts of things. And and if you remember, this is what ended up as HD five hundred and DT fifty, DT twenty five, and sort of the dream rig promise. So it's something we had talked about many years earlier. And then when I started digging, I saw some newer images. So if you're looking at this, this is the first original Helix design back in 2008. Uh, and we kept the three rows of switches and you'll see the scribble strips here. Um, and at the time we had little six character displays. Um, and then going forward, we had one with our touchscreen. This was the first design with the touchscreen built in unless there's a little SD card slot up there, and that'll make sense in a second as well. Uh, this happens to have a carousel from Amp Farm at the time, um, but it was really exciting and it, and it caused us to start talking about things like we should build this up. This could be really, really cool. Um, nobody at, at the time, you know, nobody was making a $2,000, $2,500 system with the Amp, so it was gonna be very unique in the market. But then what happened is, in 2008, the market kind of crashed and, and we realized, well, I don't know how many people are gonna be spending $2,500 on a floorboard amp combo. So we decided, well, let's shelve this for a bit. Let's uh, let's do the next process or let's make it more down to earth, which is exactly what we did. So in October of 2010, we released HD 500, but we did bring along a lot of the promise of the bi-directional communication with an amplifier. Uh, via L6 link, so you can hook up HD500 to a DT50 or DT25, and it automatically changes the tube topology and the tone stacks and that sort of thing. Um, we're gonna jump ahead really quickly because in 
January of 2012, we released this digital mixer called Stagescape M20D. And it was really groundbreaking at the time. Uh, it actually had more DSP horsepower than almost any digital console on the market, It was, or in that price range, certainly. Um, it had, I think, four times the DSP of the leading digital console at that time. So it was extremely overpowered. It had the two dual sharks that are still in Helix today. Uh, and if you look a little closer, you'll see those horizontal sliders there. So long story short, Helix is based on the architecture of M20D, whereas M20D, it uses the two sharks for different sets of channels, and then it mixes them together at the end. Instead, Helix puts everything horizontally so path one is on one DSP and path two is on the other DSP. So it's just a little different. And so in the same time, around 2011, we started working on what would become Helix. So we brought back the VETA system and let's take a look at what that looked like. So back in May of 2011, this was the first original design after we started ramping up designs for Helix. This, this had the touch screen and you'll notice it looks, it doesn't look too much different from HD 500X, and if I remember correctly, we were the code name was HD 1000. But it had the the uh, the touch screen. It had the scribble strips, and here are a few extra uh, touch screens. At the time, there were two home screens. There was the pedal board, and there was a rack. You'll see the rack view in a, in a later design. But uh, but lots and lots of work went into this. Not the best designs necessarily. Very colorful, very busy, but um, but we learned a lot. Uh, and you'll notice the scribble strips here, they were eight character displays, if I remember correctly. And at the time we found out that there were larger full LCDs that we could get for the same price. We're like, well, let's see what that looks like. And again, these are just things to kind of show people to prove that something may or may not work. In this case, it clearly did not work, but let's just put gigantic screens everywhere. And it was just obnoxious. And clearly nobody liked this. It was just it was just so overwhelming. So we were able to find half height displays. And if you notice the UI cluster up around the screen, it's starting to look a bit more like Helix. And by this time we had done a bunch of testing and we had gotten designs in front of people and they told us, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. If, what if you spill a beer? You're gonna hurt the touch screen. Like what's the difference between a touch screen and non touch screen? At the time they didn't like it. Uh, and we knew uh, we knew at the time that the next Helix was always going to have a touch screen, but we're like, let's hold off on that for a second. Let's focus on what we want to do. And then let's pivot to doing the cap sense switches that instantly let you jump to anything you want, uh, which ended up being a lot faster than touch screens in many cases, because you can jump from screen to screen. You can jump to the command center. You can jump to the controller assignments, that sort of thing. Um, here we're getting a little bit closer. We got rid of the extra two switches up in the left-hand corner. Um, and now we're getting really, really close to where Helix landed. And you'll see the, the, the clusters are pretty much where we landed. Here are some of those extra screens. On the bottom center, you'll see that rack screen. Uh, this was sort of our original attempt to try to separate the two DSPs, have one screen where you saw a, a pedal board and then you had another screen that had the rack. And in the end, we realized that was a bit too confusing and slow to get around. So we ended up putting the two paths on the home screen and just said, we'll just explain it to everybody and hopefully they'll get it and, and they have. So it turned out great. Here are some early designs. Our industrial design, Dale Wagler, who's absolutely a genius. Um, I'm just honored to work with him and consider him a friend. He's just amazing. These are some of the early designs. Again, this is a lot of people trying to put in ideas. I think, believe this idea had an LED ladder in the treadle. So as you moved it, the LED would show you where the position was when your foot wasn't on it. Um, this curved one direction. Here's one where the knobs were on the top, which I thought was a little bit interesting and odd. Uh, but this wood side panels along the side. Uh, I kind of like this one. This had the scalloped edges as well. Um, again, scribble strips are all there. It's, you'll see the joist is now a part of the design. Uh, we tried one with wooden side panels, which we thought was really cool too. Ultimately, we didn't go with that. And of course, this was the, uh, the first uh, image that Dale sent me. And a lot of us said, oh, that is the one. That's, that, that has to be it. 
And if you fast forward to June 2015, after a lot of work, after a lot of iteration, after a lot of feedback with users, after reading countless idea scale articles, um, we landed on Current Helix. If you jump forward to December 2015, uh, this is when we launched Helix Rack and Helix Control. Um, this was a big one for me. This is the, the primary Helix product that I personally use, Helix Native, the plugin. So I can take presets from my hardware, load it into my DAW, tweak things, mix the record, take the presets back into Helix. It takes 10 seconds to do, and then I'm on my way. Uh, in April of that year, uh, we had Helix LT, a more affordable version of Helix Floor. And in January of 2018 at the NAMM show, we announced HXFX, which was our first foray of Helix products back onto the pedal board. Uh, and we wanted it to really uh, be embraced by the pedal board community. And this is also sort of our, our next attempt at the M class, M13, M9, uh, all in one multi effect as well. But to really, really nail home the fact that we wanted to embrace our pedal board uh, uh, employees, because a lot of us here at Line 6, we own our own pedal boards and we have our own closet full of amps. Um, we wanted something that was really, really small. And uh, at one point, we made a really, really, really small stomp. And here are some early designs. What we'll do is we'll We'll draw these out in Illustrator, given we have a, a big library of knobs and buttons and switches and screens that are all accurate size. We'll build them uh, as origami models and run around the building and get uh, input from people. We'll take photos and send them to friends and say, hey, what do you guys think? And they're all under NDA. And, and, uh, and we sort of iterate and iterate and iterate. And the one in the lower right-hand corner, that was the one that we kind of liked. And if you notice, there was a bi-directional uh, joystick that just went left and right, and that's how you selected blocks. And something interesting that happened, because at the same time, we were designing PodGo, and we came up with this cluster, and we thought, wow, we like this a lot better. <laughs> Is there any way we can change it uh, back to uh, the original? We actually have prototypes with the joystick, but we were uh, we were able to change it to where Pod goes. So in some ways, Pod goes design informed HX Stomp's design. Uh, if you look at the origami model right there in the back, that is the height that HX Stomp would have to be if we were to go with two switches. There are so many boards in there, and there's so much componentry, um, and that was just too ridiculous. You'd have to do gigantic leg lifts just to hit a switch. So we realized, OK, we can't make it that small. We have to make it at least three switches, which is exactly what we did. The left is the origami model of the three stomp version with the, with the pod go cluster. And clearly on the right is HX stomp, which we released in October of 2018. Going forward, let's take a look. So these are all of the things we've added to the Helix family since 1.0. Lots of amps and cabs. We look at the number of effects we've added since 1.0, a lot of effects, and these are just the notable features as well. So, and we're not, we don't plan on slowing down at all. Uh, there are a couple favorites that um, I have here. Um, and if you want to have more information, we made a video about a month ago where I discussed them. Helix has over 300 amps and effects, so trying to get through that model list can sometimes be a slog. However, you may not know you don't have to open up the model list at all. While holding page left, repeatedly press page right until you find the subcategory of model you're looking for. To go back subcategories, hold page right while pressing the page left. Once you find the subcategory you want, turn the joystick. On HX Stomp, on edit view, push and turn the lower knob to find the subcategory you want, and then turn as normal to find the model. Sure, snapshots are cool, but if you have a JTV, Variac Standard, or Shuriken, they let you do ridiculous things. Select the input block, and then page over once until you see your Variac settings. Set Variac settings to preset, and Variac tuning to custom. Then page over to see your individual string tunings. For snapshot two, let's switch that, All right? We're gonna push and turn string six, which is our low E, down to drop D 
say we want to do some pull mutes and let's push and turn and turn down the top three strings. So when we play, we'll only hear the D, A, and D strings. Now let's switch to snapshot three and let's uh, turn up string three again. But let's go back and now let's push and turn and drop your low four strings down an octave so now you have a bass. So now you can actually change the tuning and the volume of each string independently. And of course you can change your Variax model, you can change where the volume knob is, you can change where the tone knob is. So you can do really, really powerful things if you have a Variax connected. If you're like me, you spend way too much time watching other people play guitar on YouTube. Learning guitar parts from YouTube can be fun, but it's kind of a pain when you have a guitar in your hands and you're, you're trying to reach over and what was that part? Fortunately, Helix and HXFX have template presets to control YouTube with your feet. Start, stop, skip back or skip forward 10 seconds, even speed up and speed down without changing pitch, say to learn a tricky solo, can all be done without taking your hands off the guitar. And this one's way easier than you think because we've already done all the work for you. So press the presets knob to open the preset list. Joystick over to the set list column. Select the template set list and choose 9A, YouTube Remote. All right, now go to your favorite YouTube video. Here's Paul Hindmarsh at the NAMM show. Press mode and you'll see your stomp switches. Press play pause and the YouTube video starts. And it stops. And it starts again. And oh, I missed that. Let's go back maybe 20 seconds. Press back 10 seconds twice. Let's go forward 20 seconds. Um, that was really fast. Let's slow it down so I can figure out what Paul played. Uh, I think I figured it out. Let's go faster. Um, you know what? I just want to jam now. So maybe I'm just going to mute the YouTube video altogether. Uh, let's turn it back on. Uh, let's go full screen. And maybe remove full screen and stop. Great. Um, so all of the features um, that we, most of the features that we've released over the last five years, have all come from Idea Scale. Um, let me give you guys the URL again. Um, and. As a further incentive to actually go check it out, I think all but two things in the upcoming 3.0 update are taken directly from IdeaScale as well. So if you can visit, debate, if, if, if you guys want to hear something or see something, or if something doesn't work quite right, uh, please let us know. And, and we're going to keep plugging away and try to make Helix as great as we possibly can. And thank you all for your support. Thank you for all of your input. Thanks for being our friends, and we will see you on the interwebs. Up next, uh, stay tuned. We have a ton of additional interviews, uh, content, videos, how-tos, et cetera. Up next, I believe, is Rhett Schrill and Matt Ferguson, Director of Artist Relations. All right, thanks, everybody. Have a great day, and be safe.